Welcome to Crossfire. I'm Brian Schweitzer on the left. I'm Newt Gingrich on the right. In the Crossfire tonight, Ralph Nader, who opposes nuclear power, and Michael Schellenberg, who supports it. After a third of a century of hysteria brought on by people who didn't know anything, we're finally having an honest debate on nuclear power, one of the energy sources that can sustain civilization. Tonight, CNN's presenting a provocative new film called Pandora's Promise. It argues that despite recent disasters, like the one at Japan's Fuku Fukushima power plant, most of the fears expressed by anti-nuclear protesters are irrational. Here's a quick preview. I came to realize they basically avoided looking at the whole picture and only looked at the questions that seemed to prove to them that nuclear power was dangerous, as I had too. The only reason I changed my mind is that I talked to experts, physicists in particular, who were the pioneers of nuclear energy and who carefully, one by one, explained to me again and again until it finally got through my head why it wasn't what the anti-nuclear activists felt it was. Ralph, let me ask you for a second. The whole process of dealing with nuclear energy, it seems to me, you have been always a consumer advocate. I mean, as long as I can remember you, you're a consumer advocate. Now you are in a situation where what, what this debate's about, if we go to purely to renewables, we're seeing already in Europe a 17% increase in the cost of energy for the consumer in the last few years, 21% increase for uh, manufacturing and business. Isn't it a fact that from a consumer standpoint, almost inevitably those kind of strategies lead to dramatically higher costs? Not at all, because the alternative to nuclear power, which is uneconomic and can't be uh, privately financed, has to be 100%, uh, almost 100% government loan guarantees, corporate socialism to you. No. Uh, <laughs> the alternative is energy efficiency. That's the first uh, platform for energy uh, policy all over the world. We waste enormous amounts of energy. Uh, uh, a megawatt of, uh, of energy we don't waste is a megawatt of energy you don't have to produce. And that's the fastest, quickest, cheapest, most job-intensive way. Retrofitting buildings, homes, more efficient motors, more efficient motor vehicles, lighting, air conditioning systems. That's even before we get into biomass, uh, wind power, solar thermal, photovoltaic, and all the others that are going to eventually uh, be the dominant form of energy in the world, wind power. But, but, but isn't it eventually, I mean, I just looked at a study today that said mm -hmm. we have something like a, an amazing multiple of subsidy for solar power today. And the projections are for the next 10 years. We're going to continue an amazing subsidy for solar power. It's always uh, the energy yeah. of the future. We've been subsidizing nuclear energy for the last 50 years, so I don't think there's anybody pure in this. But, but Michael, let me ask you, you coming from the environmental community and now being a supporter of nuclear energy, you telling us that's the way to go, aren't you concerned about radiation in our water and our air and our wildlife and our people? And if you can support nuclear energy, why not, why not clean coal like we have in Montana? Why not, why not wind power with, with abundant natural gas or, or stored pumped energy with our lake systems? Why just nuclear energy? Right. Well, before I start, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge that um, I really respect uh, Ralph Nader and I've always admired him, especially his work in the 1960s for uh, workplace safety, food safety, car safety. Um, but the fact is, Ralph's actually been saying this same thing about solar and wind and efficiency since the early 70s. I went and looked it up on the New York Times this morning. Um, last year, solar provided less than one-tenth of one percent of our electricity. The economy has become a lot more efficient over the last 40 years. We have more efficient buildings, we have more efficient cars, and we use more energy. In fact, efficiency enables greater amounts of energy consumption. So I've always been an advocate of solar and wind. I've actually lobbied for uh, the subsidies for solar and wind. Um, but when you look at what's happening in the world, this is not the early 70s anymore. Back then, no one was very worried about global warming. The world is going to triple or quadruple the amount of energy it consumes over the next century. And if we want to do something serious about the climate, our, our emissions need to go to zero from the energy sector. But even if you don't care about global warming or you don't think it's much of a problem, 
Um, consider this. Earlier this year, former NASA climate scientist James Hansen did a study. He found that nuclear energy over the last 40 years that's been used worldwide has saved 1.8 million lives by producing zero air pollution energy. And he says that if we expand it, we'll save another 7 million lives. Those numbers have to be convincing for people that care about climate change. There's still radiation. Tell that to the Fukushima area, the Chernobyl area. Tell it to the areas where hundreds of square miles are now uninhabitable. And the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1950s, Michael, said that a class nine accident in the US would contaminate an area, quote, the size of Pennsylvania. You don't want to have an energy source as one bite of the apple. You have a disaster, whether it's due to sabotage, earthquake, horrendous hurricane, or uh, human error or design defect, any of those. Ralph, Ralph, this if you have one major yeah. disaster, it'll affect yeah. all other nuclear plants. You know this, that. This fear-mongering that you've been doing yeah. for 40 years has been effective in halting the growth of nuclear energy. We've, you've stopped it. You and the environmental movement have stopped it at 20% of our electricity. That 20% saved 1.7 million lives. Millions of other lives would have been saved had we had zero pollution energy. Instead, this kind of fear mongering, I mean, look at the record. 40 years, we've had three bad accidents. Chernobyl, the World Health Organization, says 70 people have died. Outside of the Soviet Union, in Fukushima and Three Mile Island, nobody has died. By contrast, coal kills over 300,000 people per year. So you can, you can kind of paint For, these yeah, grand yeah. scare theories. Wait a minute. But the reality, you're, there's an empirical yeah. public health you're, reality. You're not listening. Start with energy efficiency. Put aside everything else. Yeah. We are very wasteful in energy, correct? We, correct? We, We're hugely wasteful. Can you wasteful. answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. We've become more energy efficient over the last 200 years, Ralph. If you look at the energy studies over 200 years, yeah. energy intensity has declined meaning we get more units of GDP per unit of energy. The last 200 years, that's a long-term trend. And over that same yeah. period of time, our energy consumption increases. Now, what are you going to do to tell the 1.3 billion people in the world who burn wood and dung for their energy that they need to become more energy efficient? They need electricity, Ralph. They need baseload grid electricity. They and it's going to come from, it's either going to come from fossil fuels yeah. or it's going to come well, from uh, nuclear. Uh, uh, do you, do you realize what the, the national security aspects of nuclear power Absolutely. Is? Do you have any idea yeah. how tempting a target the uh, fuel rods, spent fuel rods are around all these nuclear so, plants? Ralph, that brings me to... Earthquake. Yeah. Why do you think Israel has never right. built a Ralph, let me ask you this question. Why, Why do you think Israel... You know, Liam, there was an attack, actually, on a nuclear yeah. power plant with a bazooka. It was by Greens in Germany. Let, let me ask Ralph yeah. this question. Yeah. So now we've had a 40-year history yeah. of these nukes, yeah. and we have some hundred of these facilities across America. Yeah. And there was some kind of a grand plan that we were a big hole in Yucca Mountain and we were going to deliver all this radiation yeah. on railroads through the biggest cities yeah. in America and deliver it to this big hole. Uh, but nobody wants this coming through their town. Exactly. So it's all stored in their backyard. That's right. Let me How do we get rid of all this? What's your plan? How can we solve what the problem we already have? What are we going to do with First all this of all, radiation? Even if we find a depository underground that's good for a quarter of a million years, you're going to have trucks and railroad cars loaded with this radioactive waste coursing through towns, villages, farm countries, cities, uh, going to this repository. The existing 99 nuclear plants, you've had about six now closed down in the last year, uh, utility executives themselves think it's totally uneconomic. Two of them in Texas planned, shut down, uneconomic. Natural gas is killing nuclear power. But if you, if you look at the existing ones, they're aging. They're, many of them are near nuclear uh, earthquake faults, like Indian Point, 30 miles north of New York, New York City. Imagine evacuating New York City. This is First just of all, you can't, by the way, there's not water. one example but of an evacuation plan is, but it's by not, a drill. It's still, but let's just all agree yeah. that there's no plan. The plan no plan. is actually, a, a future generation Governor, of some kind of a nuke that will use it. Governor, actually, that's not true. And let me, let me, let me start by just re addressing one point. 33 countries in the okay, world... Okay, hang on, hang on. We're, we're, we're going to go to break. And so uh, when they built Fukushima and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, they told us there was almost no chance of a meltdown. Michael, you say the nukes are safe, but when we come back, I'll ask you, what makes you so sure? <laughs>